Great. Well, good morning. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us for our March Ag Sector Council seminar, which has a great title, I think. Fertilizer Subsidies in Sub-Saharan Africa, Smart Policy or Political Trap. Um, so we're very excited to have these two distinguished speakers with us today. Uh, but before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping issues. Um, first, we always like to remind people to please silence your cell phones, uh, just so that we don't interrupt the speakers, if you've brought those along. Uh, second, this webinar is being recorded, and we also have a large webinar audience. Um, our team in the back of the room is bringing in the webinar group. And so for both of those reasons, uh, we generally ask that you hold your questions until the end, and also that you use uh, one of these microphones that we'll pass around to make sure that we uh, get it recorded and that the webinar audience can hear you. I just wanted to mention that um, so this is a product of the Ag Sector Council seminar series, which actually just passed its sixth anniversary. We've been holding uh, seminars like this for about six years, and uh, been doing them in webinar format for almost four years now, uh, which has been really exciting. We've had uh, just a great lineup of speakers. Um, and Tom's actually been a part of an AgriLinks seminar in the past, so um, we're excited to have return speakers as well. And it's really grown and changed over the years. Um, it's a product of the USAID Bureau for Food Security, but it started with the old Office of Agriculture. Um, and uh, the AgriLinks platform. So if any of you ever have questions about knowledge sharing uh, for Feed the Future and the Bureau for Food Security or um, just the AgriLinks platform in general, you're welcome to get in touch with me, Julie McCarty. I'm a knowledge management specialist with BFS. Um, and I just wanted to mention that our April event um, coming up next month will be on the role of agricultural insurance in promoting resilience and inclusive growth. Uh, that should be a really interesting event, and it will be in partnership with our sister site, um, Microlinks, which is another USAID knowledge sharing platform. All right, so to introduce our speakers today and to just give a couple of words of introduction, I would like to introduce Margaret Spears, who is the director of the Office of Market and Partnership Innovations at the USAID Bureau for Food Security. So I'll pass the mic briefly over to Margaret. Welcome, and thank, thank you for participating in this important discussion uh, about input subsidies today. Um, increasing use of fertilizer and, um, and other improved inputs is an important aim of Feed the Future and is also key to, um, productiv to increasing productivity to the levels needed to, uh, to feed a growing population. Um, OK. All right, thanks. Should I start over or I go? OK. Um, so current use of um, fertilizers in Africa and other uh, uh, fertilizers and other improved inputs in Africa lags far behind other parts of the world. And increasing that is an important part of uh, reaching the agricultural potential uh, for Africa. In my office, we're particularly interested in how to encourage this in a sustainable way that doesn't distort markets or discourage private sector participation in, um, in the input markets. Uh, this is uh, very important for implementation of the Feed the Future programs, but also for um, the policy support and dialogue uh, that we have within the countries where we work. I'm particularly excited about this session, which will examine uh, evidence across countries as well as within one country on the effectiveness of uh, different policies used to encourage increased fertilizer use. And I'm happy to introduce our speakers today. We have. Um, Michael Carter, he's a um, professor of Ag and uh, Resource Economics at the University of California at Davis. And he also um, directs the um, basis access markets and um, market access innovation lab um, and the I4 in index insurance innovation initiative. And these are uh, really important, have been very important tools and um, uh, for our thinking on um, risk, um, insurance, and related programs there. Um, and then also introduce uh, Thomas Jane, who's um, a uh, University Foundation Professor of Agriculture, Food, and Resource Economics at Michigan State University. He's also a visiting professor at the University of Pretoria and adjunct professor at the Indaba Agriculture Policy Research Institute in Lusaka, Zambia. And he's also been uh, an instrumental uh, uh, partner in our thinking about um, policies on agriculture. They have a great set of presentations lined up and are certain to stimulate some lively discussion. So I'll turn it, the microphone back to Julie so we can really get started. And thank you so much for your um, participation and for your presentations today.
Thank you very much, Margaret. All right, uh, we can turn it over to our speakers. And I'll... Am I allowed to stand in the front here? Does that mess up anything? Um, if I don't sorry, blind, if I don't blind, you're welcome to stand. it's okay here. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Good. Well, it's it's a great pleasure to be here. This is an issue that's uh, both important and interesting. A couple of you were laughing at the funny picture of me. I was actually adjusting my glasses. So I, if I could see if Tom was coming up behind me to whack me over the head uh, <laughs> uh, on this one. So this is joint work uh, uh, with uh, Dean Yang, who's at University of Michigan, and Rashid Laja, who's at the Paris School of Economics. The work itself is also collaborative with the International Fertilizer Development Center, who in some sense have a dog in this fight, uh, but uh, we'll get into that as, as, as we go along. So Margaret already alluded to the stylized fact that I think all of us in this room are, are aware of the uh, use of inorganic fertilizers across sub-Saharan Africa is, is very, very low. Uh, when we got interested in, uh, you know, I'd read Tom's work over the years that fertilizer subsidies were often, if particularly if done poorly, were a really bad idea, but we were really interested in seeing if we could actually find an opportunity to really nail down what are the impacts of, of fertilizer subsidies. And uh, we had an opportunity in Mozambique, which we developed with the, uh, with the IFDC. And by their uh, kind of farmer field trials, they were saying, you know, look, every year farmers are, are, are leaving two to three tons per hectare of potential production uh, behind that they could receive if they just used improved season fertilizers. And yet in our sample, for example, roughly 10% of the farmers only had ever used any kind of inor inorganic fertilizers. And many of those were farmers who'd actually worked uh, in, in Zimbabwe on larger scale farms. And so it was sort of a, a really a good opportunity. So uh, we, we, we said, okay, well, here's a chance. You know, unlike Malawi or some of the countries that have made uh, fertilizer subsidies also, almost a constitutional right, uh, we, we said, well, here's a chance to get in and look at a small scale program and see how, how might it be done. So as a starting point here, I've just listed a, a few possible explanations. I mean, why is this a problem? Uh, why, why, might, why might the rate of fertilizer use, why might farmers be leaving two tons per hectare of maize on the table every year that they're not achieving given that the technology is already there? And one kind of explanation, it's one Tom's going to delve into in more detail later, is I call it here a technological explanation, is that they don't do it because it's not profitable, basically. The soil structures are not there, the, the actual returns to fertilizer. Uh, are not there. And there's some implications. Again, I'll leave that for Tom to talk about. Um, I'm going to skip down here to sort of behavioral uh, explanations as well. There was some work done a few years ago that said, well, actually it is profitable, but people just have trouble saving money. They, they think they're going to do it, and then you know, an opportunity for some better use of the money comes up, and they never quite get there. And so it just takes the so-called behavioral nudge to get people there. That's another uh, kind of explanation. What I'd like to focus on here today, I'm going to call them sort of core economic explanations. Could be that farmers are simply, they're so poor, they're sort of caught, they're liquidity constrained. Uh, another kind of economic pr problem might be an informational problem. They don't really know what the returns to fertilizers are. So if 90% if of farmers in a region have never ex really used those fertilizers, maybe they don't, they don't really know. Um, so that's what we're going to focus on here is might you then do uh, subsidies, for, uh, input subsidy programs, might that actually be a way to get people to learn, maybe to get them a little extra money because if the inputs are subsidized, they make a lot of money the first year and then if they can carry that forward in time. There might also be a complementarity with various kinds of financial uh, interventions as well. As some of you know, and uh, as Margaret mentioned, I run something called the I4 Index Insurance Innovation Initiative. I have more programs going on on insurance than I care to mention. Uh, but again, we're finding evidence in those programs that if you pull risk out of a system, farmers may actually find the money that they need to make these kinds of investment, and, and risk may be the inhibiting factor. So we'll come back to some of that in a moment. And finally, again, I'm not going to talk about it here, but be happy to do so. There actually are hybrid explanations. Uh, so the drought tolerant maize project, for example, is, is sort of a hybrid explanation in saying the technologies that are there are just too risky. So if you could get a, a, a technology like drought tolerant maize that pulls risk out of the system, then maybe that will relax that constraint and things might move forward. Uh, and then there's more exotic explanations about uh, where do our aspirations, hopes, and preferences come from. And, and that may be part of the story uh, as well. But let's jump right in and, and, and think a little bit more about these economic explanations. And the first question I want to mention is, if we think about this uh, carefully and we think there might be a case for input subsidies, 
Is that an argument for those subsidies being permanent or an argument for them being temporary? And I want to argue that at least the, the, at least the thinking that I can come up with, the argument should be that, that they should be a, a temporary uh, kind of thing. Uh, as Tom will give some figures in a moment, the, the problem, if it is a problem, the reality is that a number of countries have made uh, fertilizer subsidies a permanent feature of the political economic uh, landscape. But if we, and, and, and as, as he'll mention, that's a, that's a big problem because the opportunity cost of those funds can be, can, be, can be quite high. So why are we doing this? Why are we spending so much money on this? I gave a talk in Ghana last year talking about some of this work, mostly macro finance ministry kind of people. And they thought they were going to go to sleep during a session on an agricultural topic. And then when I showed them fractions, I actually used one of Tom's pictures, the fraction of budgets being spent on fertilizer input subsidies. And they all woke up and they say, oh, you mean we don't have to do that? And so they, the macro guys suddenly were at least momentarily interested uh, in the topic. So I would argue that, it, at least in the abstract, that subsidies can potentially be really smart policy uh, if they break and relax a number of kind of constraints. And I've I've listed them on the slide here. So for example, if they simply relax liquidity constraints for farmers that are really poor, if they sort of jumpstart the system, uh, then that might, be, that might be a good thing. But again, it's jumpstart. It's a, it's a potentially temporary subsidy. Also, if, if you have a group of farmers who've never really used these inputs, you're asking them to experiment. And if you ask them to experiment on their own dime, uh, the, the rate of experimentation may be much lower than if you share that risk of experimentation. And finally, any time you have something like experimentation, which really generates a public good. Uh, so if Tom experiments with fertilizers, I can see what he does, and he would rather I take the risk and experiment. If we both wait for each other to experiment, then things are much slower changing than they might be. So again, maybe a temporary subsidy might be a way to sort of break that logjam by reducing the costs of experimentation. So these, to me, are sort of reasonable arguments for why an input subsidy program might make sense. Again, there are, there's a, a whole literature on how you might do this. And let me just mention, because I'm not going to say anything more about it here today, that this, this program we're going to look at in Mozambique sat on top of an input market development scheme called, I think it was called the AIMS program, which USAID funded. And these were voucher coupons. And so they, they weren't trying to replace the private sector. It was actually done on top of a program meant to expand the supply side of the sector. And then this voucher program comes along and sort of hits it the demand side for improved inputs. Uh, but you can do fertilizer subsidies other way. The government can just import it and sell it. And then that has, there's another whole set of issues, obviously, surrounding that. But I'm, I'm going to step aside from that here. So the question I really want to focus then is the, on here is this bottom point on the slide. So if there is, in the abstract at least, an argument for temporary subsidies, will they actually work? And to examine that, we had the opportunity then, as I've already alluded to, to go to Mozambique, where the European community, in, in collaboration with the FAO and IFDC, uh, launched a temporary voucher subsidy experiment program. And they had enough money overall in the program uh, to give subsidies, I believe, to 25,000 farmers in the whole country. So in a sense, it's massively oversubscribed. We're going to focus on Manica province in the central part of Mozambique. It's a maize growing area. Uh, and we're going to look at that. And because it was such a small scale program, there was only money for two years. There was an explicit sunset. You know, we're going to do this for two years and that's it. We leave. We said, well, this is actually what we want to do. So it gives us a chance to do a proper randomized controlled trial because the amount of resources available were small. And because the program was also small, there was an explicit sunset on the program. So for us, this was an extremely exciting opportunity. The way the program worked is farmers were, uh, we had basically had a lottery of the eligible people in each community. Uh, those that won the lottery uh, got the right for a voucher coupon, which they could take to a local shop. And the voucher coupon would pay roughly three quarters the price of what were considered to be high, high quality inputs for roughly a half hectare of maize. Uh, so the subsidy was worth a little about $80, and the overall package was about $115, something like that. But there was a co-payment uh, co required. So that's the basic uh, structure. Let me just jump to this slide. So how did we set this up? Um, are the main part of our trial, and what I will largely but not exclusively focus on today, is on the left side of this, uh, of this diagram. So we got a number of communities in Manica province, uh, and, uh, and we set aside 41 of them where we were just going to do a voucher-only treatment. So we went to these 41 villages, and then within those villages, the community, along with the, with the extension 
uh, workers for those communities identified the eligible population. And then we held a lottery amongst those people with half the people winning of the eligible people in each village winning the lottery, half not winning the lottery. And the winners then were given the right to pick up a voucher coupon. Uh, later on, I'll come back very briefly to the things that are slightly grayed out on the right side of the community. In addition to that, <clears throat> we wanted to do some complementary financial interventions. And so we had, a, we had a, another set of, of basically 30 communities where we implemented what we called a basic savings program. I'll say a bit more about that. And another one where we also implemented a, a match savings program. And then within each of those communities, we also held the lottery and there were voucher winners and voucher losers, okay? Uh, I mentioned this at this time because notice winning the voucher is an individual level phenomena. So that means in any community or village, there are gonna be some voucher winners and some voucher losers. And we're going to see, in fact, that voucher winners generate information that spills over and seems to affect the behavior with a year lag of, of voucher losers. However, notice by structure here, people that might be uh, subsidized or encouraged, say, with the match savings program to use formal financial instruments as a new kind of technology, they're actually geographically insulated from the people that only got the vouchers because they were in different communities. So we're going to argue, and this will be important to interpretation later on, that we have some spillovers from voucher winners to voucher losers, but we don't have spillovers from people that got the opportunity to learn about financial technologies. And again, we did that because th this was in a mobile banking, <laughs> old-fashioned mobile banking. Opportunity Bank drove a big armored truck to the villages where the savings were being implemented, and you couldn't sort of exclude anyone from that. Okay, so uh, let me just jump right ahead here to a couple of things. I mean, one thing that's important, I, I think, to reflect on uh, in terms of the effectiveness of this program is we found that just under half the people that won the voucher lottery actually picked up and, and used the vouchers, which kind of surprised us because it seemed like it was a pretty good deal, right, a 75% subsidy on this. But in the end, that's, that's part of the reality and that's part of what makes it difficult. Now, from an uh, impact evaluation perspective, to use sort of fancy language here, this gives us an opportunity to think about the impacts of those people who were offered the program or the impacts only on those people who chose to use the program. And if you're thinking about sort of how effective is a public policy, those, the answers to those questions are, are somewhat different. It's only half the people who were offered the program actually utilized it. We're, I'm going to focus on the impacts of those who actually participated in the program, or what's called the treatment on the treated, because the big money here, besides the administrative costs, the big money here is actually paying for the, the voucher coupon. So in a sense, that's what we're going to focus on here. But if anyone's more interested in the difference, we can, we can sort of talk, talk about that. Okay. Um, so what did we do? Um, there's obviously lots of torturous academic papers, and we're being tortured by nasty referees as we go through the sort of usual peer review process. Um, uh, so let me just focus on, on, on the main kind of outcome variables that we look at. And I've grouped them here into two types, uh, agronomic variables and, and also economic variables. So we have a bunch of stuff on both maize specific outcomes, so we can look at impacts of the vouchers on fertilizer use, on maize productivity, maize yields, the, the usual kind of stuff. And then also, in a sense, more interestingly, I think we look at total agricultural production. Because you might say, well, do you just people just substituting from something else into maize, et cetera. And then finally, and I think to me most interestingly, especially for Feed the Future, we actually put a lot of effort into measuring what I would call kind of core economic outcomes. So if we're interested in food security or food insecurity, we don't really care about kilotons of maize. We actually care about families and their level of well-being. So we use standard living standard measurement survey techniques to actually measure per capita expenditures uh, in these households. And finally, we also look at the accumulation of, of total household assets uh, over time. And then the final realm in which we look at stuff is then uh, we also are able to say something about what the returns to the fertilizer are, and then also how learning operated in, in the function of this experiment. So let me jump in and use this first picture to explain the overall structure. So the subsidy period was actually in here. The first subsidy year, we, we re-randomized after the first year. The first subsidy year was actually a complete disaster. As I mentioned, I work a lot on agricultural insurance. Yields that first year were 40% of normal. I'm sure people that got the subsidies regretted the day anybody ever darkened their door and induced them to spend $30 on something fertilizer that wasn't going to work. And then we came back in and kind of re-randomized the next year. So there's going to be one, one period where we look at subsidies. And then we continue the study for two years afterwards. 
Okay, and this is what's really interesting is those, you know, the subsidy goes away, prices go back to the usual market level. And what we're interested in is, does this sort of temporary subsidy stick, right? Does it actually uh, uh, look at what happens? So here's a first picture actually looking at kgs per hectare of fertilizer. And so you can see initially at baseline treatment group is the dark line, solid line here. And the control group people that didn't win the vouchers are this lower line. And there are very low levels of fertilizer on average in the samples, just over 10 kg per hectare, jumps up in the subsidy period. And then what I'd like you to kind of focus on are these diamonds, which is the average across the two post-treatment years. But I've shown you both years because there is some indication here of a downward trend. Okay, But certainly if we focus on the diamonds, we can see the subsidies had a huge impact initially. And, and actually most of that impact uh, seems to stick. Uh, if we look at maize yields, we see a similar kind of pattern, uh, again, with the average here. I forgot the diamond there. That's my mistake. Uh, the average still being substantially above, going from under a ton per hectare to over a ton and a half per hectare. So not quite as much, maybe, as IFDC might have hoped, uh, but that's what we're seeing. Okay. Uh, if we look at total agricultural production, and again, I think this is the more interesting metric from a productivity perspective. Then what you see is actually, you know, I think there's actually some reallocation going on as farmers. Actually, if we look at total fertilizer used, it's actually a much more stable relationship. So people are using more fertilizer, not just on maize following this subsidy period, but on other crops as well. So again, we see, we see a, a pattern, a similar pattern here of the, of the impacts of this program sticking and having made a difference, uh, you know, into the, into the future. Now, if we look at the more, what I think of as the more stringent test, is okay, it looks like we bumped use of inputs in a way that sustained itself after the subsidy expired. There was no longer a subsidy and people had to pay the full, full market price of these goods. Does this actually influence people's level of consumption? So here we have our LSMS per capita expenditures uh, kind of number and you can see baseline, they're pretty much the same. At the first subsidy period, nobody's realized the harvest yet given the timing of the survey. So the surveys were right before harvest. So there's no difference there. And then you start getting a jump. And again, it's a, it's a jump of about, this difference here is about a 10% or so, 10 to 15% increase in per capita living standards that seems to persist. So for us, that was pretty remarkable that you could come in, do this small thing. You know, the story kind of fits together if you put the dollars and cents uh, together that we, again, it seems to stick. And similarly, if you look at assets here, you get a similar kind of perspective. Again, I've written a lot of stuff on asset-based approaches to poverty. In some ways, they might be thought to be a more reliable measure, certainly less noisy measure than expenditures. And you actually get a slightly stronger picture that you, you, begin, to get a, you begin to get a substantial increase, a substantial uh, difference uh, between the two. And again, these, the, these diamond differences that I'm showing you are all statistically significant in the normal sense. So the question is, what explains this? Um, when, a, when my colleague Rashid first presented this work be, before a particularly cranky uh, academic audience, they said, I, I refuse to believe this. You're telling me that after the subsidy period, the farmer's perspective, prices tripled and they kept doing that? That doesn't make sense to me. And they weren't doing it before. How could that possibly, possibly make sense? Well, the way it could possibly make sense is if farmers actually learn something pretty substantial. So one of the things we did in this study we spend a lot of time trying to elicit before and after farmers' beliefs in the returns to fertilizer. And quickly, the way we did it is we, we, we let them define bad years, good uh, normal years, and good years. And they gave us the probabilities they attached to their definitions of those. And then we asked them, what do you think the returns are to your normal technology? And what would be the returns you would anticipate to using a kind of an improved input package? Okay, and then from that we can calculate sort of what they, what farmers perceive as the expected gains to fertilizer. So we go through that kind of exercise, and what we actually find is that the, the voucher recipients' expectations radically change follow, from the program. So if we compare them after the treatment, they're, compared to the control group, they expect 50% higher returns to fertilizer than do uh, non-treated non farmers who didn't win the vouchers. Uh, if we actually go back to the baseline, it's a 71% increase. And I think that difference arguably is some modified learning that took place for the control group farmers. So our point here is that, yeah, it, they did continue to use it because they actually learned something pretty substantial and significant. Did that reflect the actual? Yeah. So in fact, uh, in, in fact, they're learning. So 
we actually use this experiment as a way to estimate the returns to fertilizer. So we have a good statistical setup to do that. And actually, farmers increase in expectations. They're still pessimistic, okay, based on their actual data. So they are at about 75 to 8. Their expectations after the treatment is about, is about downwardly biased by roughly 20%. So in a sense, the story fits together. So farmers were sort of conservatively you know, ingesting, if you will, the information from their own experience. Okay? So that's, that's to us is also interesting. So they were very pessimistic before. They weren't expecting very large returns. And the returns we get, uh, and this is helped set up part of what Tom's going to talk about, when we estimate the returns to fertilizers, each kg per hectare gives 20 to 25 kg uh, per hectare of maize. Okay, so that's sort of 20 to 25 to 1 uh, ratio. Farmers are expecting more like 17, 16, something like that. Okay. Um, so, well, there's that next slide. Okay, so <laughs> Jerry's question took me right to that point. Uh, so in that sense, we think the story sort of fits together. And the final thing I want to talk about then are sort of money matters, as I've labeled this on the slide, is uh, what, about, what about some complementarities here? So when we started this program off, we said, well, you know, farmers are going to transition from voucher subsidized finance to self-finance because there's not credit particularly available for these farmers. You know, they need, a, they need a mechanism to do that. They need, need an improved technology. And so that's where the mobile banking uh, came in. And so when we set up, we anticipated that, uh, that, that maybe only farmers that actually had access to improved savings technologies would be able to carry forward the program. Now, there's another thing that improved saving technologies can allow you to do. So in other words, a savings technology makes it cheaper for you to take money today and move it till tomorrow. And tomorrow could be the moment where you want to buy fertilizer, but tomorrow could also be the moment after the next harvest when things have gone bad. Okay, so an improved savings technology may also have, it also cheapens the price of, of self-insurance, if you will, through savings. Okay, so both of these things could potentially uh, be operative. So um, let me just, uh, let me skip over in the interest of time uh, the details of what we did. Uh, but here's what we see. So if we look at, uh, if we look, so we have different groups here. We've got the pure control group. Uh, and then here we've got the voucher subsidy group, and that's what we've been looking on. This is sort of the impact of the vouchers by themselves on living standards compared to the control group. And then if we look at the other, the other combinations, which are savings alone plus savings and combinations, we actually find very similar levels with one exception across all of them in terms of impacts on living standards, including the, the, the households that were just being given the savings groups. The other thing we find, which is really interesting, we have a a crude measure, this is, this is work in progress, but uh, I'm confident enough in it to share it. We actually find that if you look at, here's the measure of consumption variability for the control group, and here's the people that only got the voucher. Consumption variability goes up, right? They're, taking, they're using a riskier technology that doesn't always work out, as we've described. And then when you look at the groups that, and, and look down here at the group that had the subsidy, the voucher subsidy plus match savings, which was a way to really try to encourage them into the financial technology, you find they get both a 9% increase in living standards, but they do so at, at no increase, no cost in terms of increased variability. So we find this very, very interesting, and it's sort of given us a little pause as a research group to, to sort of think about it. It seems like the savings treatment is not so much uh, making it possible for people to continue to adopt it, but it makes it possible for them to continue to adopt it without leading to a radical increase in the variability of their production. In other, and so I think that, that sort of fits together in a very interesting way. So uh, again, we're still working on this just a little bit, but I think as we as a research group are, are sort of stepping back on this, we were somewhat surprised by this result. We thought we'd see a strong liquidity effect. What we actually seem to be seeing is a much stronger, that what formal savings are doing is actually allowing people to self-insure uh, much better, and that by itself, together with the information that's flowing into their systems, because there are spillovers, is actually leading people into a, a more aggressive and perhaps a more sustainable investment uh, kind of profile. Uh, so then just to, uh, to summarize here, so as we look at the results of this, uh, it's a five-year study here, we, we think we have uh, some pretty strong evidence uh, from this structure that temporary subsidies actually can have sustained impacts. These really are real constraints. Uh, it doesn't seem to be necessary in this case to subsidize fertilizer forever, but that initial push 
that sort of cheapening the cost of experimentation seems important. And indeed, uh, indeed, if you complement those, if you complement those programs uh, with some, maybe some financial interventions. In our case, we use savings as a way to reduce some of the risk. You may, you may actually get much, much larger effects. And again, as I mentioned, I do work on insurance, and in a couple of our projects now, we are finding that when you pull risk out of systems with insurance, farmers actually respond. We're getting 25% increases in investment rates in Mali and Ghana and a couple of other places like that. That evidence is still fairly. Uh, thin. Um, so uh, I think uh, I think in the end, you know, we've got some interesting evidence here. That doesn't mean the Mozambique program was done in the most intelligent way possible. It certainly was an interesting program, as I mentioned, and it's important to stress. Everything I showed you here was predicated on the fact that a supply infrastructure had been put out there, and the idea was to get mom and pop stores basically offering uh, improved uh, inputs. But that doesn't mean we couldn't do it better. So one of the issues I think that really begs for further exploration here is only 50% of the farmers who offered the, the who were offered the vouchers actually used them. They had to be able to co-finance them. Now the people that actually were declared eligible eligible were people who said they were willing to pay the 30 or so dollars that were necessary to match the voucher subsidy, and yet most of them didn't pick it up. And we asked them why didn't you use the voucher? They said, oh, I couldn't get the money together. So there's some thinking here about what's the right level of subsidy. I mean, if in fact we've cut in half the number of people who might have experimented, you know, to save thirty dollars, was that actually smart? We can sort of think about that. that's not an easy that's not an easy question. So I think there are other issues there. And the other thing then is that um, you know I've showed I've, what I've shared with you are average effects. There's a lot of heterogeneity here. There's a lot of soil heterogeneity, as, as all you know, and that's something that Tom is going to jump forward and talk to us about. And there are a number of us. Uh, I run this basis assets and market access innovation lab. We've got a, we've got about three projects right now that are looking very specifically at soil quality and returns to to fertilizer. And and these are these are really uh, complex issues, as we say. And uh, but that said, in this particular area, which sort of seems like typical low input, low productivity, sort of stuck in, in that in this particular area of Mozambique, at least these temporary subsidies uh, seem to work. So that's my favorite picture from the project, the guy taking his fertilizer home on his bicycle. So with that, I'll pass it over uh, to Tom. And thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Nice to be here this morning. Thanks, uh, Julie and Margaret, for the invitation to come here. It's uh, always a pleasure. So let me start in with uh, the title here. Um, uh, this isn't going to be a, a Floyd Mayweather, Pacquiano sort of boxing, because I, I agree that there may be a very distinct role for input subsidy programs in some contexts, in some, in some way. But I think we're all in agreement that this is, we, we have a multifaceted set of problems here that are impeding not only productivity growth in, ag in, in Africa, but sustainable agricultural productivity growth in Africa. It's one thing to get agricultural productivity growth this year or next year. There are well-known ways to do that. But to do it in a way that can sustain productivity of this in, of the system that farmers operate in over a sustained period of time, that's the challenge. And I think that's what I'd kind of like to talk about. So just by way of introduction, let's talk a little bit about it, the, the amount of, of money that governments are spending on input subsidy programs. The reason why I raise this is because in many cases it's anywhere from 20 up to 70 percent in Malawi's case of their agricultural budgets are spent year in year out on input subsidy programs over the past 10 years. That's a huge opportunity cost in terms of millions and millions of dollars each year that have you know, there's an opportunity cost about how those resources could be spent in other ways. So even if the subsidy programs were producing some benefit, the question is, uh, is that benefit equal to what that money could be achieving if it were used in alternative ways? How many clinics could have been built in rural areas? How many uh, roads could have been developed? So forth. So um, the opportunity cost issue here is one that we should not lose sight of. Um, our objectives are to, you know, how to move from a situation where many governments realize that they're in a bind. Uh, they're importing food, a global price of foods very high, 
Uh, they've seen riots and what riots can do in urban areas. So there's big political risks of not getting enough food, you know, to feed urban areas. So, so food production growth is a critical objective. But how do we move from a situation where subsidy programs can constitute 30, 40, 60, 70 percent of the national uh, budget to agriculture to one where there's a more holistic program that takes into account the, the range of sustainability uh, issues to get, um, uh, to get productivity growth. And then what would such a holistic program actually look like you know, on the ground? So uh, the work that I'm going to present right now draws from about three or four papers that we've worked on over the years. Uh, and I'm going to try to weave the, the findings of those three or four papers together. The first conclusion is that rural Africa is still experiencing fairly rapid population growth. It's the only region in the world where rural populations are continuing to rise. So the population of sub-Saharan Africa in rural areas in 2050 is going to be about 48% higher than what it is now. So, so sustained rural uh, population growth. And many of the areas of Africa, not all of them, but many of the areas of Africa have reached their land frontier. So area expansion is not possible. So what's happening with population growth is fragmentation and subdivision of land. And the data shows fairly, accurate, fairly clearly that over the last 10, 20 years, the farm size of most smallholder farmers has been declining. Another interesting fact to, to me is that 1% of Africa's rural lands contains 20% of its rural people. And 20% of Africa's rural lands contains about 82% of its entire rural population. So rural populations are highly clustered into certain areas. And that has implications for a sustainable growth strategy. One of the things we're noticing in these densely populated areas is that fallows have virtually been eliminated. And the whole system of um, the farming systems of most uh, of Africa for time immemorial have been one that were shifting cultivation. So you, you, you use, utilize this plot of land until uh, you know, it's exhausted its fertility, but land is plentiful, <laughs> and so then you move on to other plots and then cultivate them uh, afterwards. So, so you, can, you can deal with declining soil fertility easily in that system because you just move to a different plot. Uh, but that's becoming increasingly unviable with population growth and, and reaching the land frontier. So the farming systems have to uh, evolve in a way that not only sustainably plows back in nitrogen, which is, by the way, nitrogen is the primary ingredient in inorganic fertilizer. So the subsidy programs in place are primarily putting more, allowing farmers to put more nitrogen in the ground and a little bit of phosphorus too. But the, 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 the productivity of the system is going to require not just nitrogen, um, but micronutrients. It's going to have to deal with soil organic carbon and many things that are, are needed to really get a response out of inorganic fertilizer. So uh, this fallows decline is a really is a big problem unless the farming system is able to not just replenish N, but many other things as well. Soil mining is another um, uh, thing that we're seeing, the agronomists and soil scientists have been raising this red flag for a couple of decades now. Um, so end balance is going way down. Uh, just to show you how related this is to population growth, here's uh, we're seeing that phosphorus does seem to be uh, the soil content of, of carbon of soil and and um, and nitrogen is much lower in densely populated areas. The same thing is very true if you looked at um, nitrogen balances as well. So this is evidence of some soil mining. The fourth conclusion is massive soil degradation. Maybe some of you have seen this report that came out a few months ago by the Montpellier uh, panel, which reports that about 65% of Africa's farmland is degraded, highly weathered, uh, facing uh, declining soil fertility, and that that burden is disproportionately carried by smallholder farmers. So the, the red flag, I think, is starting to kind of be increasingly 
understood about the soil fertility dimension of a sustainable productivity growth strategy here. And the fifth conclusion is evidence of low and declining crop response rates to inorganic fertilizer. Inorganic fertilizer, by the way, is the fertilizer that you put in bags and, and, and is the, the stuff of, of input subsidy programs. Organic fertilizer is things like compost, um, manure. There's a lot of soil organic matter in, in the organic fertilizer. So evidence of uh, declining response rates and low response rates this is, I think, at the crux of, of the issue here about fertilizer and productivity. Survey after survey in recent years shows that the agronomic response rate to inorganic fertilizer is quite low. It can be as high as 20 or so in, in places in Kenya, but in Nigeria it's as low as 8 kilograms of maize per kilogram of nitrogen. Okay, that's not fertilizer, but that's nitrogen, the nitrogen component of the fertilizer. So the response rates to fertilizer would be about uh, three. That's exceedingly low. Uh, in places in Malawi, um, a review here by SNAP et al. shows uh, survey after survey um, showing uh, uh, maize response to nitrogen around seven to 12 or so. Exceedingly low. So it's hard for farmers, given the output prices for maize and the input prices for fertilizer, these response rates are generally unprofitable for farmers to turn a profit in fertilizer. If I calculate it right, um, Michael, your response rates are going to be about 40 or so uh, for Mozambique, which is possible in areas where they're new to fertilizer use. Um, those uh, these are areas that have been using fertilizer for a long time, and it tends to be, at, you know, once you've used it in, a, in the plot for five, ten years, um, the response rates tend to go down. Um, so anyway, the point of this is to, sh to say that, uh, that the agronomic responses, and by the way, these are about um, half as much as what you see in Asia, in Bangladesh, in India, in places the nitrogen response uh, is in the realm of 30 to 40. That's irrigated. You can do water control. This is dry land. So uh, dr the, the dry land part of this is a major one of the reasons why uh, these numbers are so low. So highly variable crop response rates too. This takes the most productive region of Zambia. It's natural region 2A, uh, where the maize, it's kind of the maize bed, bread basket of Zambia. And it looks at the response that farmers are getting to, to inorganic fertilizer use. The mean is about 16, um, uh, 16 kilograms of maize per kilogram of nitrogen. But you can see that some farmers are using uh, fertilizer fairly efficiently. They're getting 30 kilograms of maize per kilogram of nitrogen. But at least a third of that sample are getting uh, unbelievably low resp response rates. And what are the, you know, some of the reasons for this are not just um, low uh, soil fertility. Could be floods, could be pests, it could be striga, it could be um, monkeys coming in, you know, at harvest time and taking the crop. There's all manner of these issues. These are some of the risks that Michael talked about that farmers need to take account of when using uh, inorganic fertilizer. Um, uh, so, so. Anyway, so there's, there's multivaried constraints on the profitability of using fertilizer. We've concluded that there's four signs of unsustainable land intensification that are happening in much of the region. One is soil mining, and, and soil mining is technically de defined as the, every time you plant uh, you know, a, a crop, it's pulling out nutrients and you're not replenishing it the next year at the same rate. So the nutrient content of that soil just increasingly gets lower and lower and lower over time. And um, that also constrains the uh, crop response to, to inorganic fertilizer. The inadequate recycling of organic matter. And organic matter is one of the critical uh, complements to nitrogen. So if your soil organic carbon content is too low in the soil, you may apply nitrogen fertilizer, but that soil becomes technically non-responsive to inorganic fertilizer. So the soil organic content is a major factor that will influence uh, 
uh, the economics of using inorganic fertilizer. The demise of fallows, as I've said, and then the limited profitability of using fertilizer at full market price. So partially the explanation for number four is some of these other ones like two and three. Uh, so it's an interrelated system and the idea of getting uh, uh, farmers to want to use fertilizer at the full market price will require dealing with these measures of uns uh, these aspects of, um, of the system as well. So what are the factors that are depressing nitrogen use efficiency? Well, uh, I've talked a little bit about this one. There's a very interesting study uh, from Malawi that's going on that uh, looks at soil samples that were taken in about five districts of Malawi 20 years ago by the FAO. And so these soil samples record all the kind of plot content, uh, soil uh, carbon content. And then they went back to those same areas and did a thousand uh, sa soil samples in the exact same villages and areas 20 years later. And it's a very, it's very alarming. Uh, the, the measures of soil fertility 20 years ago were generally much higher than they are now. And agronomists and soil scientists talk about a threshold level of soil organic carbon. Many of those plots now, soil samples now, were below that threshold. So there's something very serious going on here that cannot be addressed simply by increasing nitrogen. This was done by uh, Pasuel Morenia and Chris Barrett a few years ago from Kenya. They've, plot, they've um, put the plot carbon content, this is basically a measure of soil organic matter, on, on this axis, and then the maize yields on this axis. And as you can see, there's sort of a nonlinear, but definitely a relationship between high levels of uh, soil organic matter and, and yields. And then they recorded uh, the, the relationship between uh, the nitrogen response to inorganic fertilizer and again plot content and found the same thing that the basically the profitability of a small farmer using inorganic fertilizer is very much related to being over this uh, uh, a certain threshold of uh, plot car content in in many areas of sub-saharan Africa where uh, soil testing has been done Maybe about half, a third to a half of all of the smallholder farmers are in this range, somewhere below about 1.5 to 2. And this is the level that's required for profitable use if you use a VCR measure of about 2. So, um, so a serious issue. Acidification, I haven't even talked about that. This is a big problem in parts of West Africa, um, northern Zambia. Uh, increasingly Western Kenya. Acidification um, is measured by the pH of the soil and once you get below about 4.8 or so pH level the um, phosphorus has trouble being absorbed by the plant so you can apply the basal fertilizer at planting time the phosphorus really won't do you much good uh, in acidic soils. Uh, so here is a plot uh, from Mississippi uh, everything on this plot is exactly the same except for this one received uh, two or three helpings of lime and lime is what you put to re reduce the acidification problem and you can see pretty dramatic differences. These, these are the pH levels uh, here. Acidic soil, a little bit amel ameliorated uh, soil after liming, pretty big difference. And then here's what, uh, this picture is from Zambia, same thing. These two plots are exactly the same in every way, except this one got uh, a big dose of lime the, the previous year. This one did not. So uh, northern Zambia has a major problem with acidification. Third one, micronutrient deficiencies. This has been um, discovered in Ethiopia. I don't know, for, for those of you that are familiar with kind of the Ethiopian story, there's some interesting... Uh, work that the ATA is doing, the Agricultural Transformation Authority, and apparently they've done <laughs> soil mapping in Ethiopia and have found that boron and zinc were two of the limiting factors that inhibit the response of inorganic fertilizer. So the, apparently there's been um, additions of zinc and boron to uh, fertilizer mix in Ethiopia and boom, uh, there's this big increase in the response rates that farmers are getting uh, 
nowadays uh, in Ethiopia. So in, in some cases, micronutrient deficiencies are pretty important. So everybody agrees, almost everybody agrees, that inorganic fertilizer use has to go up. It's exceedingly low. In any kind of sustainable intensification strategy, it's hard to envision how African farmers are going to you know, be internationally competitive or anything close to it unless massive increases in inorganic fertilizer. So I think we're all agreed here. Why isn't it happening? There's this sort of cycle that we think is, is happening that's exacerbated by land pressures and uh, reduced fallows, increased fertilizer use, but increasing fertilizer use on soil that's not going to give farmers a good response. As a result of these deficiencies in the soil, uh, it leads to low crop response rates to nitrogen and then depressed profitability. So the solution has to be how to get the response rates up enough, dramatically up enough, so that year after year after year, farmers are going to be able to use fertilizer in a profitable way. Right now in Zambia, um, this, uh, this is a, um, maybe not the best way to show it, but it shows that 37% of Zambian farmers cannot use um, top dressing, that's urea, profitably. But about 93% of Zambia's farm population doesn't seem to be using basal application profitably right now. So no wonder use rates are extremely low unless they're subsidized. So I've talked about some of these reasons. I'm going to kind of go through the litany now of, of various factors that are um, reducing nitrogen response. Soil moisture. By the way, do you know that in, in areas where uh, soil organic carbon is, is quite high, it contains about 2,000 tons more water in that soil than um, uh, the same hectare of land that doesn't have very much soil organic content. Because that carbon is like a sponge. It holds water. So it allows, um, uh, it, it's actually insurance against drought. So this, the soil organic matter tends to have all these desirable properties that interact well with, with uh, inorganic fertilizer. Sig Snap, a colleague of mine uh, at um, Michigan State, she's an agronomist. She has, some of her work points out that the ability of farmers to use fertilizer efficiently is cr crucially dependent on weeding. Something as mundane as weeding. If you're not weeding and getting those weeds out of there, the weeds tend to compete for the nitrogen with the may stock. So, uh, so weeding is a, a and, and there's many reasons why farmers uh, have problems uh, with weeding intensively. Crop rotation, uh, I won't go into that because I'm kind of getting short on time. My, my bottom line is that uh, there seems to be a problem with nitrogen fixation. And I, I'm not talking about, uh, I'm not talking about <laughs> Uh, legumes that fix nitrogen in the soil. I'm talking about people who are fixated with one, nu not one nutrient uh, when it's a, a multi-varied you know, set of constraints here that need to be addressed to get the sustainable part of this. So our conclusion is that input subsidy programs need to be a part of a more holistic approach that can make nitrogen use profitable. Okay, uh, I'm limited on time, so let me just uh, um, um, go to elements of what a holistic strategy would look like. So the first one is R&D, and public sector R&D is in a sorry state in many countries. They're way underfunded. I'm going to show you a picture of what Zambia's soil chemistry lab looks like in a minute. Uh, extension programs, how to scale up. There's, there's a knowledge issue. There's a there, how, to, how to scale up in a way that farmers can actually be um, reached. Many uh, extension programs in Africa are virtually defunct. Extension agents don't have the way to get out there. Uh, they have no, no petrol in their um, in motorcycles. Uh, there's just not the kind of um, education programs to reach farmers. Um, and these programs are crucial to complement increased inorganic fertilizer use. Conservation agriculture, 
Uh, we believe there's great potential in conservation agriculture, but there's also a low adoption right now. Farmers are not adopting conservation agricultural practices at the rate that we would expect them to. There's problems with those that need to be kind of retrofitted a bit. Physical infrastructure, um, getting the cost of the inputs to farmers down. Interesting study from uh, Ethiopia shows that you know, over half of the cost that farmers in remote areas of Ethiopia pay for fertilizer are the costs that after they enter the country. It's not the cost of production. It's not the cost of international transport. Not the you know clearing it out of the port. It's what happens getting it to the farmers once it's in Ethiopia. Um, so reducing the costs in these input supply chains, and then lastly, more appropriate fertilizer use recommendations. Many of the recommendations that public sector gives to farmers about how much fertilizer to use are based on trials. They're not based on actual smallholder conditions. So they tend to greatly overestimate, you know, use 400 kilograms of fertilizer per hectare. That's way too high uh, compared to what fa smallholder farmers are going to be able to use profitably given the constraints that they face. So um, one of the often asked policy questions is, you know how to how to be less negative. Um, I, you know this debate about fertilizer subsidies has been going on for a long time. People have asked me, you know, if you're saying this isn't the right way to go, well, what is? What's the right way? Uh, concrete guidance to improve their effectiveness. Um, so we have three proposals. One is try to complement <laughs> subsidy programs with the other holistic <laughs> elements that I talked about a moment ago. You know, five or six things that could make input subsidy programs more profitable for farmers. Second issue is to target poor farmers to achieve more equitable outcomes. I'm going to talk about number two real briefly, and then the political will issue. So the first one was get the other complementary parts of the system in place uh, to allow subsidy programs to earn a payoff for farmers. I've talked a little bit about those, the extension, the R&D. Uh, programs to you know get soil organic carbon more in the system. Uh, the second one is reconsidering the targeting guidelines. Here's a case for Zambia. Uh, nationally representative survey, this is about 14,000 households. You see that most of the farmers, 41% are between zero and one hectare of land. They're certainly the poorest. Between these first two categories, about 75% of the farmers have less than two hectares of land. But look at how the subsidy programs are, are, are allocating fertilizer. Um, the, by far, the biggest recipients are the ones that, you know, this 3% of farmers down here who are operating 10 to 20 hectares of land. There's a political economy here. Um, and when you can control, you know, in an experiment who the recipients are, you know, you don't have to worry about that. But then when you get into the messy world of actually you know, allocating public funds to recipients, that's where the political cha economy challenges come in, and many of the um, benefits do end up getting, um, uh, you know, let's, let's say diverted. Another um, issue here is um, we found that about one-third of all of the fertilizer going through the subsidy programs in Malawi and in Zambia end up getting diverted by government, somebody in the middle. And the way we were, I'll, Q and A, if you want to know how how we you know established that, but uh, when one third of of two hundred million dollars gets diverted in the middle, that's a huge problem that's going to reduce the cost effectiveness of this program from the standpoint of the recipients, who are supposed to be the, the smallholder you know farmers. So our third proposal about subsidy programs is. Can there be greater political will at the top to root out corruption? These programs are vulnerable to corruption. So uh, to make them operate better, um, we certainly need a little more will at the top um, to make them operate better. This is a, a ranking of alternative investments based on um, kind of a meta study of Asia, seven or eight countries in Asia. Um, and here are the various uh, public sector um, uh, strategies or, or investments, and I've ranked them for you. Um, the Economist comes up with uh, policy environment, enabling environment is number one. Agricultural R&D, investment, number two and three. 
Input subsidies is somewhere near the bottom uh, of the economist list in terms of the contributions to agricultural growth. IFPRI's study is only from India, uh, but um, there's a very similar ranking there. And then uh, we also ranked it with respect to poverty reduction. So the, uh, if the goal is poverty reduction, once again, fertilizer subsidies don't end up looking too good on the list of overall investments. So that harks back to the first uh, graph that I put up showing you know, $200 million uh, a year going to input subsidy programs and, and the opportunity costs uh, involved. Um, so th this doesn't say that the results that Michael presented you know, are, are not right. I, I believe them totally. Um, but when you get to um, kind of the messy reality of implementation and um, trying to integrate these into uh, public sector programs, there's a lot of things that, that need to be factored in. Um, my main message uh, is that, um, this third one, that spending a large share of the ag budget on in input subsidy programs may not be the most effective way to go given the payoffs to other things. Certainly a demonstrable way to show uh, your constituents that you're doing something. They're very visible. They're, they're very politically um, desirable. Um, this is my main message, um, that subsidy programs would certainly be more effective if more of the budgets were allocated to the complementary public investments that are required to make input subsidy programs more effective for farmers. Those complementary public investments would be extension programs. But in, in order for extension programs to be effective, they have to be based on good science so that extension agents are extending the right messages and working with farmers in the right way. That's public R&D. And there's a lot of problems with the public R&D system right now, and that should be one of, I think, our greatest, uh, our, our greatest um, point, you know, entry points in FTF and CADAP programs and things like that to revivify what the messages ought to be to be going through the extension programs. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. And we have um, about 20 minutes for q and uh, I'll pass the microphone around. And please uh, state your name and organization. And uh, we'll kind of alternate between the in-person and the online audience. I think there'll be a lot of questions. So we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, and then there'll be a bit of time to gather later as well. Great. Thank you for those presentations. Those were wonderful. I'm Laura Schreich, and I'm with uh, USAID and Bureau for Food Security. Michael, you spoke a lot about fertilizer, but always with also my understanding was with improved seed varieties. Tom, your main message at the end was that the fertilizer subsidies need to need to also include other complementary complementary investments. But you never mentioned improved seed varieties. Was that implicit in what you were saying? And if so, I think it needs to be really okay. needs to come out. And if it wasn't implicit, then why the difference in what you guys are talking about? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. You should we do one at a time, or do you? Okay, fine. So yes, uh, public R and D uh, is, you know, seed improved seed varieties are one of the key things that come out of pu public R and D systems. So I will, I'll be happy to say it explicitly. I agree that that improved seed varieties that are more fertilizer responsive uh, is definitely a key priority. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll take it back to our online audience and then come back here. Sure. Uh, this first question comes with a bit of uh, context. Um, we have Leslie Gardner who says, the voice of smallholders seems to be missing too often in these discussions. And due to their remote locations, poor roads, and need for seasonal credit, a growing number of middlemen offer agrochemicals on credit in exchange for the right to purchase harvest at, at very low prices. And these middlemen are not manufacturers, but they're distributors whose power comes from access to transport, finance, and markets. And there's an alarming change in power relations and, and problems with distribution channels that will affect the sustainability in the long term. Um, so Sierra Bercio says, uh, how do we avoid the danger of benefits being captured by, by the manufacturers and traders and not the smallholder, smallholder farmer themselves? <laughs> 
So, do you want me to take it? Or do you want to? I can okay. say a little bit about it. Okay. I mean, that's a that's a that's a very interesting observation, and I think um, uh, it's, it's a contentious issue. I mean, when you get into a kind of a sole source supplier of anything, there there's a concern that uh, that someone's going to grab up uh, most of the. You know, I meant I used the term of money being left on the table in terms of. Of, of productivity increases that weren't taking place, and and I think we would all agree that if it's if it's a, a highly monopolistic kind of situation, there's at least that possibility that 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 a lion's share of that that will be. And so again, I um, so I I don't know that I have anything in general to say about that. I mean, I think we you know there are some some instances where we see well developed value chains that will actually lend inputs against the standing crop. And and there, there's often, you know, there there's a, there tends to be a little bit more, I think, of an equitable distribution, just because there's there's more shared interests. If there's simply a middleman, there's there's certainly that kind of possibility. Again, what we see in the Mozambique study, I think, is interesting. Again, I want to emphasize that was built around an effort to create a more competitive supply sector. And I think our per capita expenditure, our living standards results suggest that while surely some people were, other people were making money off the fertilizer sale, there was, there seemed to have been plenty left over to improve the standard of living of the family. So, uh, you know, I would agree that we need to be mindful of what are those market structures out there that might permit the finance of these kinds of things and, and competition in those, in those circuits are certainly very, very important. I'd add to that. I think in the question, I, even though I didn't hear uh, the person who asked that question, were they referring to in subsidy programs, or were they referring to just normal, com you know, commercial supply channels? Um, that's a big problem in subsidy programs and in subsidy supply chains. Uh, it's quite common that actors are trying to grab a little in the middle, grab a little bit of the. Um, uh, benefits of that before they actually get out to farmers. Um, I don't see that happening a great deal in competitive commercial systems. Um, yeah. um, again, I want to thank, uh, I think everybody here had come and was quite justified and so hearing two of the, hearing uh, two of the best uh, agricultural experts in the world talk about one of the most high priority um, issues, but I had a question that really is mostly directed to uh, Professor Jane. Mm -hmm. um, your prescription is both very complex and requires a considerable amount of public sector capacity. And I think in many countries, the policy people who'd hear you would say that it's too complex and our public sector is simply incapable of delivering things like that. The mm -hmm. statistic that I always like is more than 80% of Nigerians don't know where a post office is. The post office has more or less ceased to exist for most Nigerians. Wow. Um, so it, 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 the question is, um, how would you answer that? And is part of the answer the kind of experiments people have done about trying to create private sector or mobile uh, phone resident systems or anyway, something mm -hmm. that does a, ra uh, a end run mm -hmm. uh, around the public sector. Yeah, interesting. Wow. Well, first of all, thank you for your kind words at, fr at first. Uh, your, your check will be in the mail uh, later today. Um, now, about uh, how to um, do that, um, there are a couple of um, uh, schemes that are being set up in Nigeria now to evaluate the mobile, um, uh, what's it called, the voucher system through the mobile phones. So I think the jury is out right now, but it'll be very interesting in about a year or two from now to see how that program performs. So I, I think we'll need to wait a little bit longer to find out. Um, I agree with you that um, many politicians will are looking for fairly simple fixes, and that's what the real seductive appeal of input subsidy programs are. In one fell swoop, you know, you can you can ensure that farmers are going to be using more fertilizer than they were before. So that's why these programs have such staying power. Um, I think that's our job. You, you, you know, all, your job, all of our jobs, is to 
try to make the case for why a holistic strategy, even though it's going to be more complex and require you know more attention to more different things, why that's still there's no substitute for getting that in place. Yeah. I can't I can't imagine how a, you know you don't have a public R and D system that's functioning. How you're going to get sustained agricultural productivity growth without it? And and I do mean improved seeds. You know when I say that, that's sort of the, the group that tends to be producing those seeds. If I could just say a little bit on those on those issues as well, and I want to mention a couple of ongoing uh, uh, research efforts that. So part of what a good public sector can do is provide, as Tom gave us some examples of, of zinc deficiencies. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the questions that is an interesting one is how much higher are those fertilizer response rates if, if small farmers actually get sort of tailored fertilizer blends that would actually work mm -hmm. for them. That doesn't take care of this, mm -hmm. the soil organic comp component itself, yeah. but may mean a difference. So mm -hmm. uh, the, the research group I run, uh, BASIS, has a large project in western Kenya right now where we got the, we did soil samples in all our farmers' fields, and we came up with four distinct fertilizer blends, mm -hmm. most of which included a lot of zinc and boron compared to what's normally available in the market. And now we're actually going to be able to look mm -hmm. at that uh, you know, does that actually make a big difference? So we'll have those. We actually just finished the survey to find out, but we haven't analyzed the data yet. Mm -hmm. uh, related to that, there's another basis program run by someone named Cheryl Palm at uh, Columbia University, where she's using new mobile uh, soil labs. <coughs> Basically, it's, it's sort of a soil test in a box sort of thing. It works through the internet, uh, through mobile phones, actually, and you get an instantaneous readout of what the fertilizer blend should be. So again, those are interesting. I mean, that's a that's sort of cheapening what the public sector used to uh, provide. I think in reality, and, and certainly one of the discussions we've had a lot with Cheryl and her team is, okay, great, a farmer knows he needs this much zinc in his blend, but how's a, a two hectare maize farmer to pick even someone on the larger and how are they going to buy that? So there's still an issue. There's still an issue of the fixed costs of doing that and sharing that information, and, and secondly, sort of making it actionable. But I think there are some possibilities. One can start to imagine. I mean, here's where maybe I've not always been a big fan of the, you know, in development business, we have love with the uh, ICT kinds of strategies. But here may be a way you get quick information. Maybe you can find a way to collate orders and, and you know, uh, low cost transmission. And if you can get it delivered, there may be ways to do that. So I think there are some new frontiers. And again, that's, that's something that we're, we're sort of pushing out on to see what, what more can be done that's better. Uh, we'll go back to our online audience, and then I'll come over here. Sure. This next question comes from Brent Simpson, and it's for Michael Carter. Uh, what guidance does research give us regarding the level of subsidy required and the length of the subsidy period in order to maximize farmer benefit at a minimum cost? OK. <clears throat> That's a great question uh, uh, as well. And I think what's uh, that's what uh, you know we what we don't know from the study in Mozambique is whether a larger amount of subsidy could have been more effective, or whether two years or three years would have been better. This was effectively a one-year set of results that we were looking at. So there probably are ways to do it better. I guess my own kind of gut instinct is that um, um, that you know a short time period is probably okay. Although again, in this the first year of this program. I mean, we basically didn't do data collection and didn't implement most of the things because it was just a, a total disaster. Uh, uh, but it seems to us from this that a, a relatively short period where people had reasonable outcomes, you know, provoked fairly strong learnings. And as I indicated before, they weren't naive learnings. If anything, they were still somewhat pessimistic and conservative, which is probably a good thing, right? You don't want people to get sort of wild-eyed and crazy and start throwing things on. I do think the, the you know where did the 30% copayment come from? I have no idea. That's just the way the the program was set up, and that's how we evaluated it. But we do see a relatively low take up rate, and with a lot of people saying they just couldn't get that 30%, or they weren't willing in the end to put that 30% into it. So you know maybe at that margin uh, it might be better. But again, I think the political economy issues here are are just tremendous in terms of what does a politician want to do? And I want to suggest that there's an asymmetry. Uh, there's an asymmetry in the in the in the sort of the political staying power here. I mean, if farmers can really learn something in one or two years from a once-off subsidy program, they're going to be kind of happy about that, right? 
But the people that really have a lot of political clout are the people that are in the fertilizer business. Uh, and and uh, you know Tom's comments on on, on acidification of soils. When we met with our, our, our crop so, so, soil science people in Nairobi, they actually showed us, they said, look, what your farmers mostly need is lime. And they said, but there's no lime subsidy program because there's not much money in it because lime is relatively cheap. So don't even think about it. You know? So there's a, there's a political economy here that's not just political economy of the farmer. I think that's something we can maybe solve with temporary subsidies, but the, the sort of more global political economy of people that actually have a lot more money than farmers do to throw around uh, politically is is at a is at a different level. So the, the the political issue here is is not a is not a trivial one. But I think there would be warranted. I I believe it would be really interesting uh, if one if one were impressed by these impacts of short you know the impacts of the Mozambique study to experiment just a little bit more with amounts of subsidies and see if you could get a faster take up and, and greater amounts of learning with a you know modest increase in the amount of the subsidy offered to the farmer. In some cases where acidification is a problem, subsidizing lime could be a very important thing, both for learning and, you know, for, I, I think, we, you know, we should think about that um, in terms of maintaining subsidy programs but using commodities or inputs that farmers really don't have any experience with and that the private sector may be unwilling to provide on its own. A very good case could be made for those things. All right, um, here, I'll pass it to you. Why don't, why don't we take uh, just two questions in a row, if that's all right this time, and then we can answer both. <laughs> okay, so uh, I talked with Tom uh, before this. I'm Jerry Wogan, USAID, and I talked with Tom a little bit before the session, and we agreed that I was one of the more experienced, otherwise older people around remaining in aid. And one of the things that happens is that you see things over and over again. So when I saw Tom's litany of the problems that people face, it seemed to me that if I had asked that same question in 1979, that litany wouldn't be much different. That is, the only, the two things have changed between 1979 and now, maybe three. So one is that government policies with respect to ag marketing and exchange rates and the way in which they screwed farmers on the price side has changed in general. Um, second, Tom's point about the fact that there's been huge population growth and therefore the land margin has decreased substantially and the possibility for extensive growth is quickly eroding. Um, and I don't remember what the third was. But, uh, oh, I, I guess this fact that there's a, a, a growing uh, growth of an urban uh, class that wants higher quality uh, food products, and, and, there, and there's a growth of that uh, farming to, to, to uh, satisfy that demand. But the, the big problems for smallholder uh, staple food producers remain the same and, in fact, are probably worse. And so I think it seems to me that there are two major issues that one has to solve. One that's probably impossible, which is all these political economy questions, because the governments are what the governments are, and the interests are what the interests are, and, and there are ways of getting around it in, on the margins, but it's very hard to, to, to break it. But the second is something that, uh, that Michael sort of dismissed, and, and, and I've never really been a big fan of, but the information technology. It seems to me that a lot of these problems, including the problems of taking up fertilizer and so on, are information problems. And I can foresee some time 10 years from now when information technology will have uh, become so pervasive and so developed that a lot of the government problems will disappear in terms of how you do extension and, and, and research and so on. And, and, and the problem of getting very specific information to, to farmers on their fields will be a lot easier than, we, than, than now. And I just wondered what you thought about that. Sure. Yeah. Well, thank you. I want to um, ditto the appreciation for your presentation. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Um, and so my question and comment is about sort of we. I find it interesting. So we're mentioning some of the problems with corruption, and then farmers having access to the inputs that they might need for in or an organic fertilizers access. And um, 
and what would happen if we took all that funding, and I hear, I, I hear you saying that, and we put all that money into the R&D and extension side, and we focused on soil fertility management, and the Brown Revolution was where we put all of our money, then would we have all those you know, problems, like he needs the nitrogen, he needs the lime, he needs you know, the corruption? So I'm um, a proponent for focusing more so on the you know, soil fertility management side of things. And I don't know that we do all agree that we need inorganic fertilizer if we invest ahead of time in some of the more sustainable land care and, and soil fertility management issues. But I would be curious about what you would think about that. All right. OK. All right, thanks, Michael. Uh, so, Jerry, I agree totally. Um, there's a guy named Mark Andreessen who was the one who started Netscape. Um, he, had a, he predicts that within the next 10 years, every human being on the planet will have a smartphone. That they'll come down in price so dramatically that people in rural Ethiopia will be having smartphones. And apparently, according to him, uh, there are hundreds if not thousands of software developers who are right now working on getting apps for this two-thirds of the world that currently doesn't have a smartphone but will within a very short amount of time um, in order to provide services to them uh, that will, you know, uh, uh, th this whole range of services that you're talking about in terms of information technology. So I can only say that I I, I totally agree. I think it's not a pipe dream. Um, but who knows exactly how that's going to play out. But, but I, I do agree that farmers will probably have much more access to technology than they certainly have now. Now, if I understood your question right, it was that um, in, in, in advocating for other kinds of public programs like extension and R&D, there might be corruption issues there as well, and that um, uh, um, you know, how do we uh, mitigate those things? I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm sure that that's a, that's probably correct. Um, when you said um, we're not all agreed that increased nitrogen has to go up in organic fertilizer, um, I, I guess I, I, I am aware of that point of view. Um, I, I am almost. I, I can't see how we're going to really uh, triple and quadruple yields right now in Africa without heavy doses of nitrogen, along with um, increased soil organic carbon and um, you know micronutrients and just healthier soils. Um, I can't see how to get that boost in yields without uh, massive in increases in nitrogen. So, so but I think. It probably could, but it'll be much more expensive. I think it would cost a lot more to get that kind of nitrogen nutrient from other sources. Um, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting question, and there are other people out here who, who might, might have more information about that than I do, but I'm, from what I've read, um, it doesn't look likely. Yeah. yeah. And if I could just, just say uh, very quickly uh, a little bit to, to Jerry's question. Um, you know, something we haven't talked about, but I forgot that I brought with me these wonderfully colorful handouts, if anyone here in the room would be interested in them. But one of them is actually a discussion of what private sector does, too, because private sector does input subsidies. So one of the things up here is our project in Western Kenya with a private seed company, and their whole marketing strategy is the first year they give away seeds for free. Right, and what's up here is actually the learning that takes place from that, uh, as well, you know, and kind of comparing it to the learning from a public subsidy. So it's not such a weird, you know, it's not such a weird idea of a temporary subsidy. They only do it once, right? And 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 in a sense, they think it works. And so it's it's an interesting issue. And I don't want to dismiss IT either. But one thing that comes out in the Kenya study, in particular that I think is very specific to African soils is, you know, how much can you learn from other people and how much can you learn from yourself, which has something to do with the density of these kinds of programs. The question a moment ago about levels of subsidy is also like how many people need to get seeded with coupons. And one of the things we found in Kenya where we did all this 
uh, soil quality measurement is in communities where there's a lot of heterogeneity in soil, and we measured it by the Kenyan exchange capacity, which someone told me is the best measure of the likely in productivity impacts of fertilizer. In communities where that's highly heterogeneous, people actually don't learn from each other. They don't know what the CEC is anything better than I do, but they do know that what happens on their neighbors does not have a lot to do what happens with themselves. And that sort of points out Number one, that people actually are learning in an intelligent way. But number two, the ability, however we communicate information, if we are in environments where there's a lot of heterogeneity in, in underlying soil conditions, it's going, to be, it's going to be really hard to make information messages uh, be taken up and, and kind of stick. So we, those are all things we have to work at. I think IT solutions can be a big part of that in, in ways we discussed already a little bit. So. Well, we're getting close to time. Um, since our online audience won't be able to ask you all questions afterwards, I thought we'd take one final question there, and then uh, you know, there should be a little bit of time to nab the speakers afterwards. So last question from online. Sure. We had uh, one participant who was concerned about farmers who can't afford to participate in a subsidy program. And they made a comment about a policy reform that, that makes the adoption of best management practices a prerequisite to, to joining the, the subsidy program. And he was wondering if you could speak to that. As in, they would adopt a best management practice in lieu of a cash uh, contribution to the subsidy program. OK, great. Um, there are some programs uh, right now that are testing that uh, at CIMIT. Um, I'm aware of some researchers who are looking at that. And I think it has great promise. So I'll just leave it at that. But uh, we'll let the results speak for themselves when they come out. But I think it has great promise. Yeah. I mean, that's the idea of sort of a sweat equity match, if you will, instead of a cash match. And that's a good idea. I mean, mm -hmm. see that in a number of kind of programs. I mean, I, I do think the idea of a self, of a contribution is useful because I think it helps people take it more seriously. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. Lena Heron, who, who manages the basis program that I direct, always tells me, you have to get mission buying because if they don't put money in it, they aren't going to pay attention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's maybe the same kind of thing. Maybe farmers are just like USAID missions, that if they have some of their capital involved, then they, they pay more attention. And, and, and I think that's a, that's a really, I think that's a really interesting, uh, a really interesting kind of idea. I would say that the, 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 you know, part of what's coming out of this Mozambique study, and, and let me reference a study in Ghana that was done by Dean Carlin and colleagues, uh, where they explicitly ran a horse race between risk reduction versus uh, cash grants. So you basically set up a trial where some people got money, and, they set up, and the other arm is people just got insurance. And the question was, which is going to induce greater adoption of new technologies? And what comes out of that study is actually they seem to get the bang for the buck if from the risk reduction. So if risk is reduced, people seem to have the money. And it's not that they've been sitting on it. You know, the money has been there largely set aside to as a form of insurance. And if they feel like they have a, an alternative for insurance, they can reallocate that portfolio. So mm. I've worked for years on capital constraints, and I firmly believe that, the, that the, it's a huge, huge problem. But I think the risk side of that is also very, very important. And that's what part of what I think we're seeing in Mozambique is that if you get people better financial instruments that help them manage risk, there may be a little more liquidity in the system than we that's, that's, that's available for investment purposes once the farmer becomes convinced that they can do that in a prudential manner and not actually threaten the family uh, livelihood security. Uh, well, I'm sorry we can't get to all questions. I always try and end as close to on time as possible. Um, but I uh, very much would like to express my appreciation to our presenters and to all of you who are um, repeat customers to the Ag Sector Council Seminar Series. I see a lot of familiar right. faces this time around. Mm -hmm. um, so we appreciate it, and we hope to see you at future seminars. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.